It's time to take a look at the 2024 AP Chemistry exam questions. The free response questions have just been released, and now we're going to walk through the answers. Hi there. My name is Jeremy Krug, and this is my walkthrough for FRQ question number two. I need to let you know that I don't work for College Board, and this is not an official answer key. You'll need to wait a few months for that. I'm just a guy who's been teaching AP Chemistry for the past 24 years. And if you're getting ready for next year's exam, then check out my full AP Chemistry course videos right here on YouTube, as well as my comprehensive review materials, along with exclusive tips and tricks over at ultimatereviewpacket.com. Now, let's get started. Question two is a long FRQ. And in this one, we have a chemical reaction between maleic acid and sodium bicarbonate that's occurring in the presence of water to produce carbon dioxide and sodium hemaliate, as represented by this equation that is balanced for us. Part A says, a student combines equal masses of maleic acid chunks and sodium bicarbonate chunks with sufficient water at 20 degrees Celsius. The student de determines that 0 0.0114 moles of carbon dioxide gas is produced after the reaction goes to completion. And part one says calculate the number of grams of carbon dioxide produced. Well, it tells us how many moles we have, 0 0.0114 moles. All we have to do is convert that to grams. So in our conversion factor, I'm going to put one mole on the bottom. We put grams on top. And we can consult the periodic table and see that there are 44.01 grams in a mole of carbon dioxide. So we can cancel moles. And when you multiply this out, we find that there are 0 0.502 grams of carbon dioxide produced. Part two says the carbon dioxide gas produced from the reaction at 20 degrees Celsius was collected and found to have a pressure of 1.25 atmospheres. Calculate the volume of carbon dioxide gas in liters. Well, this looks like a good case for the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, because we have a pressure given to us. It's 1.25 atmospheres. The question asks us to calculate the volume, so we're going to solve for V. Now, the number of moles of carbon dioxide was given to us up here in the header. It was 0 0.0114 moles, so that goes in for N. Now, R is about 0 0.0821. I'm going to go ahead and use the 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per, per mole Kelvin given to us in the equation packet just to be that much more precise. And then T is temperature. Well, it's 20.0 degrees Celsius. And if we convert that to Kelvins by adding 273.15, we get very close to 293.2 Kelvins. So when I plug these numbers in, I can use some algebra to solve for volume, and the V is equal to about 0.219 liters. Now, just in case you're wondering, if you just added 273 instead of 273.15, that's perfectly fine as well. I think you'll get the same answer. Now, as we move on to part B, it says the student performs a second experiment that is identical to the first, except that the student grinds the chunks of maleic acid and sodium bicarbonate into powder before combining the powder with the water. And so question one says, what happens to the surface area of the reactants when the student grinds the chunks into powder? Well, when you grind something into powder, you know, you have smaller particles, so we have a greater surface area. So we'd say that the surface area of the reactants increases when they're ground into powder. Now, part two kind of continues on this idea. It says the rate determining step for the overall reaction is the dissolving of the solids. Would the time required for the dissolving of the solids in the second experiment be longer than, shorter than, or the same as the time required in the first experiment? And justify your answers based on the collisions between particles. Well, if we have the particles that are now ground into a smaller uh, particle size, well, the time that's required for the dissolving of the solids is going to be less than the time it was in the first experiment where we had larger chunks. Now, the idea here is that when the particle size is smaller, uh, you have a faster rate of reaction, which means the time it takes for the reaction to, to, to go to completion is, of course, going to be less. And the idea here is that when you have a smaller particle size, you have more, literally more places or more spots on the molecules or on the uh, uh, particles, I should say, uh, on those reactants. And so you can have more particle collisions between reactants that can occur. And that's what speeds up the reaction rate. 
So that's the answer to B2. Now B3 says when the reaction is complete, will the volume of carbon dioxide gas at the end of the second experiment be greater than, less than, or equal to the volume at the end of the first experiment? And justify your answer. Well, I would say that it's going to be the same for both experiments. Now, even though in the second experiment it did go faster, the fact is, if you look up here at the header, it says that everything else is identical, uh, except that the, the, that the particle size is smaller. This implies that we have the same quantity of reactants. And so if we have the same quantity of reactants, well, we're going to have the same quantity of products too, aren't we? So that tells us that it should be the same. Now moving on to part C, we have a student who's conducting additional trials of the experiment and produces this data table here. We have two more trials in the equation. And it says, based on the student's data, identify the limiting reactant in trial three and justify your answer. So if we look at trial three, it looks like the student is taking 1.543 grams of maleic acid and reacting it with 1.251 grams of sodium bicarbonate. And we want to find out how many moles of carbon dioxide will be produced. So I'm going to convert both of these to moles of carbon dioxide, since this is a limiting reactant question. So in our first step, just like we always do, we convert to moles. All roads lead to moles. So I'm going to convert grams to moles, uh, grams on the bottom, one mole on top. And if I consult the periodic table, I find that there are 116.07 grams in a mole of maleic acid. So I can cancel grams top and bottom. And now I can go on to the mole ratio. So maleic acid goes on the bottom and carbon dioxide goes on the top. And if I consult the balanced equation, I see that this is a two to one ratio. Those are the coefficients of the balanced equation. So the maleic acid goes out and if I multiply and divide, I see that I'm making 0.02659 moles of carbon dioxide if that were the, uh, the reactant that was limiting. But it, it doesn't seem to be because that's not the answer that we have. Well, let's go ahead and double check and see if we get that answer for the sodium bicarbonate. So once again, step one is convert to moles. So grams on the bottom, moles on top. And if I add this up, it's about 84.01 grams in a mole of sodium bicarbonate. So grams are out. And in my second step, it's mole ratio again. So sodium bicarbonate on the bottom, carbon dioxide on top, because that's what I'm converting to. And in my balanced equation, this is a two to two ratio. Those are the coefficients for that. So sodium bicarbonate is out. And if you want, you can cancel those twos as well. And when you divide, you find that we have 0 0.01489 moles of carbon dioxide. And take a look, that's exactly what was produced. So that tells me that this is the answer. And so the limiting reactant is the reactant that produced that smaller amount, which is sodium bicarbonate. So that tells me that the sodium bicarbonate is the limiting reactant in this process. Now, let's move on to part D. We have this same reaction, and it says that the reaction has a value of delta S, or change of entropy, greater than zero. Using particle level reasoning, explain why the entropy increases as the reaction progresses. And essentially, if we think about this in terms of particles, we have aqueous solutions starting out here. We have several particles of that. But notice what it turns into. We have even more particles produced at the end, and two of those particles are gases. And we know that in the hierarchy of entropy, gases are about as high an entropy as you can get, can't they? Gas particles are really chaotic. They're moving around. They're independent of each other. Gas particles are more highly dispersed. They have more disorder. They have more possible energy states than aqueous solutions uh, that we started with. So this tells us that the entropy in this process is increasing over the course of the reaction. So delta S is definitely greater than zero. Now in part E, it says that the student notices that the temperature of the reaction mixture decreases as the reaction takes place and correctly de determines that the reaction is endothermic. So the student claims that this reaction is thermodynamically favorable at all temperatures because the entropy is increasing, delta S greater than zero, and the reaction is endothermic. Now, do you agree or disagree? Well, if you've uh, 
learn much about thermodynamics and chemistry, you know that this part right here, the fact that it's endothermic, should be a red flag. If something is endothermic, it's not going to be thermodynamically favored at all temperatures, isn't it? Because we know that the universe really doesn't like endothermic reactions. And so uh, the answer is that we should disagree. And so since delta S is a positive number, you know, greater than zero, and delta H is also positive, endothermic, this means that the reaction is only going to be thermodynamically favorable at relatively high or relatively uh, very positive temperature. So that's your answer for part E. Now for F, we go back to acid base. And so we have a student who's investigating the acid base behavior of maleic acid. The student notes that the maleic acid is a diprotic acid, and we have the two processes here. And part F says calculate the pKa2 value for this ion that's produced in the second dissociation. Well, pKa just means negative log. So if the Ka is 8.5 times 10 to the negative seventh, well, that means that the pKa is just the negative log of 8.5 times 10 to the negative seventh. So when you key that into your calculator, the answer is about 6.07. Now part G, we have a buffer solution with a pH of 7.00. It's prepared using those uh, two ions here. It says to calculate the ratio of the conjugate base to the conjugate acid in that solution. Well, this looks like a good case for the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So what, yes, Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to the rescue here. So the pH is 7.00, and the pKa we just said was 6.07. And we're going to find the ratio. So we're just going to plug and chug. When you subtract, we get 0.93 equals the log of the conjugate base over the acid. And when you take the anti-log, we find that the ratio is about 8.5. So that's your answer to part G. I hope you got all these right, or I hope uh, if you didn't get them all right, or get a lot of them right, I hope now you know why. Uh, thanks for watching. Join me very soon when we'll take a look at FRQ question number three.